systematically destroyed indigenous culture and history. Um, as I researching, I've come to understand that land acknowledgments are not about the soil we're standing on so much as about the people who were here before us, but also more about our relationship with the living than with the deceased. In reading, in, in researching, because I thought, I'm not just going to say this, I'm going to do research. So, which I'm LA. Um, the historical Italian uh, territory encompasses huge. It encompasses the Santa Clarita Valley, San Fernando Valley, the Sini Valley, and the Antelope Valley. Um, the, um, it, the, it enters history, it enters colonial history, um, it enters the archive with what is called Session 286 on June 10, 1851, 170 years ago. Seeding the lands um, from what we now call Long Beach, um, along north, over 100 miles of coast, what we now call Santa Maria, forming a rough triangle inland that encompasses the current cities of Bakersfield and Palmdale, while creating a very small island, um, a, a, a very small reservation, which was not the rights to which were later abrogated. Uh, when I thought about Doing the series, Janice Lee was uh, at the very top of my list. Um, Gabrielle gave me really wonderful advice, which is start with people who you know, people whose work you know that you can talk about. And you know, and I know Janice's work really well because I was very honored and lucky to have Janice as a student as a, as, in the MFA program here. Um, and then as a colleague um, teaching here for several years. Um, I'm very sad to see Janice go. Um, Janice is um, a writer, editor, teacher, and shamanic healer, which you may hear and will teach me to read. She's the author of seven books of fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. Um, she's the founder and executive editor of Entropy, co publisher of Civil Coping Mechanisms, which I learned is the, the Gabrielle Seville Publisher, publisher of Swallow the Fish and Experiments in Joy, and obviously where they got the name Civil Coping Mechanisms. As an intro, I don't, I don't like I don't like calling intros. What I like to do is read a bit of the person's work. This is a, a short excerpt from the essay Spaces in Transition from the Skies in Blue. The people out there that don't seem to notice that the world is ending, that the end days aren't a distant future, that there will be no quick and brutal end, not biblical, not disastrous, not immediate, not far away, but here and now, and slow and gradual, present and now and now, 
today and this moment dying. The weather tells us, the sky tells us, the ground tells us, the sun tells us we are living in the apocalypse and the apocalypse, the apocalypse is living in us now. Dying is a synonym for living, is a synonym for dying, is a synonym for changing, is a synonym for time. Hope is life, is fire, is death. Waiting is hope, is eternity, is sadness, is feeling, is death. Love is happiness, is living, is memory, is touch, is being, is breathing, is breathing, is breathing, is death. Welcome, Janice Lee. Yeah. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here, thank you, Matias, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, it's really special for me to be back here in this place after so many years. So um, thank you for welcoming me and for having me in this space and for joining me. Um, so I'm going to read from this new book, Imagine a Death, and I don't want to say too much about it. It's about a lot of different things for me. It's about the apocalypse. It's about the climate. It's about freezing. Um, everything that Nikki has just read, um, it's about trauma, it's about um, ancestors, it's about relationships. Um, and so I'm going to just read a few uh, vignettes, a few chapters from this book. So this is The Dream. In a dream, there is a small huddled crowd of people. Their faces bright from the encroaching lava that is slowly crawling towards them from all sides. They are surrounded, and it is obvious to all of the individuals that there is no escape from the fiery death, so they do not ask how it is that they got here, and they do not ask what they might do now to save themselves. Rather, in these final moments together, they crowd closer together. Not to give themselves an extra breath or two, though naturally that also, but to actually get closer together. But in these moments before death, they want to leave in the intimacy of each other, whether strangers or family or friends. They want to feel what it is to be loved and to be in the entanglement of intimacy with other bodies, the warmth of limbs, the prayers received from others, the tears of terror that transform into tears of generosity and gratitude. And they all grasp at each other, trying to feel each other's bodies, each other's hands, just each other. And as the lava creeps further and further, they can feel the heat from the steam, the skin on their faces starts to boil, those on the outer perimeter start to scream as their outer layers burn away and their feet simply disintegrate into the mass of lava. The intense heat, heat here is probably an inadequate word to describe the actual temperature of the fiery mass about to consume them in totality, for just a blink of existence, reminding them of what it means to feel anything in life and to feel anything in death, both the joy and all of the pain, all of those human feelings as a giant and intense mass before they are obliterated and relieved of their burdens forever. Is there like a strange echo? Is that like, like really haunting myself? As a <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like kind of appropriate. I was like, oh, am I already a ghost? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this next one um, is in honor of Michael's shirt right here. Yeah. This is the squirrels. The squirrels remember in decades. That is, while they breathe circles into the winter air, one will slip down the muddy walkway and have the spine pressed upright by a memory of running forward. Dry cough and chilly wind like needles showing up for another on a street corner in the dead of night. This isn't his memory, but he recognizes the early morning vibration, the ground shaking, the sky shaking, his feet. And he knows that in order to appreciate the sun, he will need to traverse the street and be elated, at least momentarily, by the unused water cooling on the side of the street. He sees the other squirrel when the crow starts clicking, sitting atop a wire and the sun finally blazing down to proceed in today. It is day. 
The squirrel approaches the other, and cheeks wriggling and butt smashing into the grass, he presses the palm of his hand into her chest, and her mouth rewinds. The arms might lose themselves in dreams, but the squirrels always know where they are. When one is no longer visible to the other, there is no crying but a shouldering of the post and the fullness of survival that contracts and protracts with the waning and waxing of the moon. He knows not to demand, and she knows not to wait up. This comes from experience, from decades of memory. After all, if they are running in circles and up and down trees, the memories ought to loop and figure eight patterns as well. So when creatures grind their teeth, it is not only during evening slumber. The pea plant. This is from the point of view of the pea plant. It tucks us into the cage. Some of our tendrils reach out and they meet the surfaces they were looking for. In other parts, we feel limbs snapping off, cut off, and still we reach for hard surfaces and light. It touches us in places, and sometimes this guides us to the wall, to the edges of the cage. It touches us in others as if testing, as if making a decision about whether to let us continue to teach, to move, to become. We are always becoming, and it lets us know when and where we might proceed. We only know to touch and be touched. We only know to climb and let our tips move forward. And we ask to be guided because we cannot see, but we can feel. We can feel every movement and coaxing and gash and pull and nip. And because we are flexible, we can be convinced of anything. And because we want to live, we can justify any of its actions for or against us. And because there is always space for one, there is also always space for two. Um, so there's three human characters in this novel as a writer, so the photographer, <coughs> an old man, and they're all connected in certain ways. Um, but what unites them is that they're all dealing with um, how past events are still affecting them in the present and how they feel angry to them. Um, and so one of these characters, an old man, um, I'll read one of his pieces. It was as surviving the shipwreck as if he knew exactly how many days had passed since the ship had run aground in the storm. But what had been lost was not a ship, some wooden vessel that would transport him away from here where he might be able to sit, legs crossed in the sun, one hand holding a glass of lemonade and the other an oatmeal cookie. No, he had lost something far greater, something that felt like bones cracking, like being torn asunder under a starry sky, like perhaps his old life lost forever. And here, I don't know how to go on, he thought, as if surveying the island he had washed up on, as if this was the shore where he might die. And it was hard to know if this was the very shore he had originally set sail for, but here he was, grieving the loss of something he couldn't remember, and when he looked out upon the vast darkness, what he saw was the blue sea, just like in the Emile Nolet painting, thick and blue and green and dense and swallowing, that sense of gazing for a long while at something, but only the tiniest stirs and movements that let you know you are not eyeing an artificial image, but the real landscape, just that still, just there, still and still. And then something stirred in his chest, a great and urgent desire to know how to set sail. That is, he had been fixed at this point for so long. How long had he been simply standing there on the shore, soaked through and filthy, the other survivors asking him more and more specific questions that he couldn't answer, and all he could do was continue to listen. That is, continue to live his life in the way that he had, with so much control over everything around him to make things just so so that everything had revolved around him. And even when hit by a storm such as this one, he had somehow managed to keep it all in orbit. But he did remember, didn't he? He knew he had to get out. Even if he died on the journey, wasn't life just a journey to death anyways? And he whispered, as if the incantation would make it true, I'd like to know how does that sail. There he stood at the edge of his bed, hunched over, his right hand still grasping the mattress for support. 
outside some kind of maddening squall of birds and dogs attracting. And he thought for a moment he could feel the slow binding movement of the ground beneath him, the sort of rumbling that vibrated his feet, the tremor that emanated from difference, that is, the difference in remembering and not remembering that had triggered all of it. And the mattress was all he could hold on to to keep himself from shuffling like a crab, and because he was tired, he stood still, stood completely still for just a moment longer to open his eyes and see. Wasn't it just the morning, or was it the feeling of the cold ground on his bare feet that might drive him to insanity? After a recent accident, the old man had slowly been losing his sense of smell and taste. The injury had mostly affected his nervous system and his sense of balance, but the doctors explained how his ears and nose and brain were all linked. And at first, he took solace in the fact that he was still mobile and would take his evening walks and listen to the birds outside. But as his sense of smell and taste faded, so did his connection to food and the memory of his mother, the desire to walk to the grocery store, and the usage of his joints and his interest in organizing the spices and his enthusiasm in organizing at all. And gradually, all the pleasure of chewing the food dissipated. And because he had to eat but couldn't enjoy it, he started to feel more and more like the food he was chewing inside of his mouth and the chef preparing the food. And he began to have dreams of being diced up and thrown into a boiling pot of broth or being pruned and plucked alive in a giant monster's mouth taking a bite out of his side. And one day, he planted two tomato plants on his balcony. And it became his morning routine to come outside each morning to check in on the plants, to breathe next to them, to try his best to shield them from the heat, but let them absorb some of the sunlight. And he could sense their struggle in the climate, and he could only describe it as the feeling of getting close to a fire or to a truce. And it was all he could do to prevent himself from drowning in the heat, from simply slipping away into steam. But the tomatoes articulated for him better than anything else what was happening. And each morning he would check to see if the tomatoes had ripened. And it was his conviction and the hopelessness of the situation, the hope within the despair that kept him going. After all, he felt no need to try to explain his own actions to himself, but he had made mistakes and he had chosen a certain trajectory that couldn't be undone. And wasn't this the kind of waiting that could lead to something quite extraordinary? He knew the facts. The tomatoes were not ripening, though day after day he offered his eyes and pruned them and watered them and watched the sun. It was too hot. In these extreme temperatures, the tomatoes wouldn't begin the process of senescence and therefore wouldn't ripen. Senescence was essentially the process of getting old. The old man was now old. Getting older, and he too, like the plant, was sessile and barely left his apartment. Tomatoes, when ripening, give off ethylene, which induces other nearby fruits to ripen. Smoke also gives off ethylene. Burning almonds gives off ethylene. If one were to pick the unripened tomatoes and bring them into the apartment where it was cooler and expose them to the smoke of burning almonds, senescence could be artificially induced. This is the same process that gives color to autumn foliage, whereby the leaves become bright red or orange or yellow, and then at their peak of beauty fall to the ground, the descent that makes it possible for others to ascend. It is possible for anosmic plants that are mutants to lose their ability to sense ethylene, anosmia being the loss of the sense of smell. And the old man, after his accident, was now anosmic and had therefore lost the ability to smell, which also meant that he had lost the abilities to taste and to maintain balance. And though he couldn't ride a bike anymore, found pleasure in other activities like roasting almonds, letting them burn, watching the smoke, and simply waiting. The old man didn't want to be led astray by the facts, though, because as he knew, facts often betrayed and deceived and oversimplified things. 
and he had learned his lesson in the oversimplification and over-control of life. He had reached the point where a collective self might strip himself of all of his masks to show his nakedness and be free of any tethers to the past. But he was not haunted by his past. He had longed to be haunted by her ghost. He would have been less alone, yet he had managed to survive. Without the desire to survive, he had gone to great lengths to ensure his continuance. And when a man loses his love or the obsession that drives him, and when a man is unable to taste the tomatoes that he grows and eats, there is a slow careening down the side of the mountain, the tumultuous crash that happens in slow motion, and the arrival at the base of the mountain where a ship has been torn apart by the rocks. And there lies the single survivor of the shipwreck. And this is when one understands that no map can show a man his fate, that it is his tether to the unknowable and inexplicable that becomes more important even than love. And when one dead man meets a survivor, not even the narrator can tell which is which. The dream. In a dream, there is a girl who encounters a large bear in the woods. And the bear, in its insistence at being a bear, stands tall and growls menacingly to warn the girl to turn back and go home. And the girl, in its insistence at being a girl who still falls asleep gripping her teddy bear, tightly moves closer. Wondering how soft the bear's fur might be, and the bear, though confused but gripped with his own intentions and narrative, bears his teeth, and the girl runs forward, squealing and giggling, and wraps her arms around one of the bear's legs, and feels the rough fur on her cheek, and a strange but not unfamiliar odor emanating from his body, and the bear slowly leans down and strikes the girl, who is still hugging him tightly with his claws, and discards the little body into the river where it stains the surrounding water red, and what the girl had thought to herself just before she was killed was how much coarser the fur had felt than she had expected, but still the warmth was comforting and that she could have fallen asleep right then and there. And I'll read one more. Uh, this one is the whales. Um, it's one of my favorites in here. It is um, dedicated to um, J35, also known as Taliqua, the, um, the killer whale who carried her dead baby on her back for two weeks in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and this is also dedicated to the humpback whales in Star Trek's The Journey Home that save the Earth from disruption <laughs> because the humans can do it. So this is the whales. What is the pattern of predictable sounds that, in its steadfast refusal to cooperate with its interpreters, shakes you at your chest, wraps its oral tendrils around your waist, and asks, what do you see in your future? She was seized by the fullness of survival. And as the last boat sped past, she gritted her teeth and shouldered her body next to her mother's. Seams of space closed off by flesh. And as the water began to clear, she was able to see again. She scooted up to look into her mother's eyes, and the eyes let her know they had seen everything they needed to see, or there had been nothing to see at all. They had, in the past days, seen many of their friends disappear or leave. Any insistence on coalition heard silence, and there were less and less tiny things to swallow up, less and less places to hide large bodies from those that lurked in the shadows above the shadows. So that swimming to the surface to watch the dust dancing in the sun was no longer a relished pastime. Her mother had tried to remain connected with the others, but they were afraid that her visions had been a bad omen. 
that there were so few of them now because of what she had seen, and that they would better fend for themselves far away from her connection with the kingdom of the dead. She had now known that before her there had been another who had died before even seeing the sky, and that her mother had carried that other upon her back for several days, the others urging her to let go. But how does one let go of everything? How does one simply allow for such finality when it is a piece of you that must be discarded and dropped into the sea? I won't pass this on to you, I promise, her mother would whisper every evening. Especially on full moons, she would watch her mother's eyes cloud over, tongue tucked back and voiceless, but water running along the contour of her massive body. And her mother would hum as the moonlight rode over her skin, and when her eyes cleared like the water and when she spoke again, it was always the same. She didn't want to confess to her mother that she had started to feel the shudders too, that sometimes during the rainstorm she could feel a tiny voice like a grain of rice trying to reach her lips, her resistance making the voice more insistent. And though she wasn't afraid, she didn't want to worry her mother. Her mother knew enough that has had enough ghosts following her, hated knowing the fate and endangerment of their kind, but without the others, could do nothing about it except to sing. That eerie melody that carried through the water and over the surface, through air currents and upward into the atmosphere, the kind of melody that human composers strove for years to construct, hear, and pour out of her. More than just a song, but a lament. An intimate tether to all other forms of life. A resonance that even the pigeons with their blank stares roosting on telephone wires would feel, but perhaps not be able to parse. Yet this wasn't a sound to be parsed out or interpreted. It was meant to be heard and received and felt and transposed into tears or waves or touch the openness of a broken heart. Another day ended and the light bounced off of the trembling surface, two whales bobbing under the starlight. I like the nights up here, she said. We can see the stars. They are not our stars, her mother responded. Both knew more than they let on to the other. And when the blue of the night finally ran out, they awoke to another boat passing overhead. She didn't know why, but this time, instead of swimming deeper and hiding, she had a feeling penetrate and a voice that ebbed inside her like the tide. And so, in a flurry, she turned to her mother and only whispered, don't worry, as she swam upward to meet the dangling hand slowly slicing the water. The hand connected to a little girl was gentle. The little whale jumped up and the girl beamed in excitement, though the girl wasn't alone. There were two men with her, each with various recording devices and other equipment, and they spoke words to each other, and the girl responded. And as more lights turned on, the girl leaned into the water, put her hand on the whale again, and said simply, don't worry. The whale bobbed there for a moment longer, the girl's hand still resting gently on her head. And when the girl finally removed her hand, the little whale ducked her head underneath the water and returned to find her mother. That night, the girl and the men could hear the whales singing. They are singing to save the world, the entire world, she would say. And the men, with their fragile devices and advanced machines, would record the music and nod in agreement but say nothing, just nodding from time to time as the songs would create spikes of different heights on their screens. All of the lamentations of two grieving souls seeking intimacy articulated in the rise and fall of jagged black lines. And somewhere out there, the whales would swim and sing because they were alone, but with each other. A reminder that loss and exile are linked, and the sound was a way to stay connected with the movement of their bodies through the water and the air, and the sky, and the tremblings of the earth, and the breaths of all the living beings. And that night, there were more lights in the sky, even more stars being born, and an unanswerable tether to time. Thank you.
happy with the you part two. Yeah, I think they'd love to stay up here. Do you wanna do you wanna would you like an uh, MC or the network? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has. I have a question. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming and talking mm -hmm. and kicking off our series here. I'm just so great to have you here. Um, I love that you read the whales, and I'm reminded that. There is a beautiful whale tarot card, actually. And there's a series of tarot cards that, aha, um, were also kind of commissioned as a part of this novel. So I was curious if you wanted to talk a little bit about tarot, but also maybe even more broadly, sort of systems of divination or belief and how they impact your writing or this particular book. Yeah. Um, so there are some tarot cards here. There might not be enough, but, um, but feel free to take one. And if there's not enough, and if you give me your mailing address after the reading, I will mail you one. Um, so just, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think about, um, I think Silas uh, Satyr's room in um, the book. What is that called? Meet and, meet and, Anyway, the meat and spirit thing. Meat and no, spirit. The, the one about divination. Oh. It's like divination and poetics. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You can Google it later. It'll come to me. Um, but she writes about like how poetry and divination are very linked, right? Um, in terms of the association that it calls in. For me, things like tarot or divination, um, it's really about using your intuition and making something external or having something external clue you in into the internal. Okay? And I was talking about this earlier um, in, in the class um, that I was visiting that, you know, for me, writing is a way to make something external that needs to be external first in order for me to process what is happening internally. Okay? I need to be able to see it. And, and I think the same thing with tarot, for me, why it's so useful is, you know, the cards aren't telling me something that I don't already know, but I need the cards to tell me in order for me to be able to articulate it and see it, right? Because I have a brain and I'm a human and I will convince myself of many other things that may not be true, but sometimes I need, you know, whether it's the cards or the plants or whatever, um, to actually clue me into the wisdom that I already have and I might have forgotten. Um, so that's kind of how I see this. It's like, Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, hearing you read, especially those first parts, um, there was a restlessness to the, to the language that felt very poetic. Mm -hmm. And I know from having the pleasure of reading the book that that came from uh, these run on sentences. But I was wondering what your thinking, feeling is the difference or lack thereof for you between poetry and prose and how you approach that in your writing. Yeah. Um, I feel like I would have answered, I feel like I might answer that question like differently in a different hour of a day or a <laughs> given day, right? Um, Cause I think that like for much of my life, I thought about um, prose and having a relationship to sentences and narrative um, that's very particular. And, and poetry also has a relationship language and narrative, right? But I think for me, it's about the vantage point that each one can give. So if if I'm thinking about something that is called fiction or prose, um, for me, I have certain ideas and expectations about how I want to relate to sentences and what I see as narrative operating, right? Um, and through poetry, I have a different lens of language, like in a pain and of attention, right? For me, poetry is a lot about attention um, and the language that's articulated out of the attention, right? Um, and so I think they end up merging, right? So when I'm writing fiction, I'm also paying attention to it and, and, and using language, um, but working both within and expanding what what um, a novel or a, or a work of, of fiction might entail, okay? Um, and so I could write a prose poem um, and have a different lens and a set of expectations on it and maybe you might not be paying attention as much to character and plot because I call it a prose poem, but if I call it a short story, maybe you'll pay attention to character and what's happening with the character and the setting in a little different way, right? And so I think the, um, the categorization for me is also 
the, the vantage point that I brought in, but also the vantage point that I'm hoping that our reader might also put on it. Thank you. So the whales was one of your favorite stories. Could you just talk a little bit about the process of writing that story? Yeah. Um, so most of the pieces in this like came when I knew I was writing the book. There's a few pieces that were written kind of independently, and then later I realized were part of this book, right? That they weren't written with the intent. And the whales was one of them. The whales was actually, um, I don't remember when, but there was a period, I, I was living in Los Angeles, and I just felt like um, both myself but other people needed some more intimacy and generosity in their lives. And so I just posted on social media that if anyone needed a story, they could uh, pick an animal and their mailing address, and I would write them a story about that animal. And, the, and so someone who I didn't know wrote me and um, requested a story for uh, his daughter um, about whales. And you know, I had no idea like the context or anything. Um, and so that was a story that I sent. And usually when I do something like this, I don't keep them. Like, like I write it, and for me it's also an exercise in like, um, you know, not being precious about things and just having it be the gesture. But for some reason, that one I felt like I wanted to hold on to. Um, and he wrote back and said, um, you know, this is beautiful, it's perfect, and she's grieving the loss of her mother. And um, I'm going to show this to her later when it's when when she's ready. Um, so that's how that story came about. And I think because I wrote it without stakes, like because it was written as a gift rather than it being a project that I thought was going to have an audience, I just kind of poured into what I was feeling at the time, which was a lot of grief around what was happening, like with these, with with, um, with Talik with the whale, but also my own relationship to my mother's death and many other things. And all of that kind of just ended up. In, in the story. Mm -hmm. I could make a, a, a common question. That's remarkable because all you had from him was that it was the sort of destination of his daughter, right? That's, that's the, that, that was your prompt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The whale wasn't the prompt. It, the, that was the animal that, that he picked the whale because, the because it, was her, it was like her favorite animal, I think. I can't remember the, the exact details, but yeah, the, the only prompt I asked for like was pick an animal and I'll write you a story about that animal. So that was the only thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really like touched and fascinated by that practice of writing as an act of service and as a gift to, a, to an addressee. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk more about that practice and if it's part of, if you consider part of your healing practice or if that's discreet from that. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it probably is related to my healing practice now, but I didn't think about it because I didn't think of myself as a healer when I was doing that. And I think this started, um, you know, I first started doing it for members of my community. Um, so, uh, members of the entropy community or people I knew, I would um, ask them for um, six words and I would write them a Sistina. Mm -hmm. And I would handwrite them and then, I mean, I've never, I, don't, I haven't kept any of those. Um, and I would also do them in person. Um, we did it at Mission Creek, Ariel was there and a few of my other friends were there and I wrote Sistinas on, on napkins, right? Um, and I think for me, I mean, I, I can't remember where, it was it was here. I don't remember who, but it was like something about like not being precious with your writing. And I can't remember who taught me that, right? Like I think sometimes getting too attached to our writing um, isn't always productive, right? Like there's a difference between um, appreciating and holding on to. There's a difference between um, you know knowing that something belongs or grasping onto something, right? Like desiring and grasping are, are very different. Uh, they used to like save everything. Like anytime I edited the line out and put it into a doc, must use this way. Like as if every sentence I wrote was genius, which it totally was, but I was like, I can't throw this away. And, um, so partially the practice from that, but it was also like, 
Um, I mean, honestly, it also started because I wanted to give people gifts, and I um, am really bad about giving people <laughs> gifts. Like, like I just have a bad memory, and I don't always think of it. And at the time, I also didn't have money to send people gifts, right? And I was like, what can I do that, like, feels like a really meaningful gesture? And so that was something that I felt like I could do that was like, this is just for you. I didn't keep any of those poems. I don't have any of those. Um, so if people, you know, burn them or lost them, I mean, that's fine. Um, but it was, it was just that was like the gesture, like this is for you. And um, I think sometimes, you know, art doesn't have to be for an audience, right? Sometimes it could it can be a gesture of, of a gift, like that. That that could be, um, you know, all it is. And I think that can be really meaningful as well. And Sestinas, just because I was obsessed with them, because when I took a poetry class in undergrad, everyone kept saying, like, this is the hardest form. Like, you know, no one can master the form of Sestina. And I'm like, oh, well, then. Um, so I didn't master it or anything, but I just really liked that it was a form, but an irregular form, right? Like, so those of you who know Sestinas, like, it doesn't have, like, an AD in the structure. It has a crazy mathematical looping structure where the repetition, if you're listening, doesn't feel regular, like it's not predictable if you're not seeing it on the page. And so there was something about that, like kind of irregular, like uncanny repetition that really appealed to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you can you talk just a little bit about the influence of, of film and other media on your work? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the biggest influence, um, the biggest filmic influence in this book is the Hungarian director Belatar. Okay. Um, uh, who we've talked about. Um, so, and, and the reason why him is because he's known for these black and white apocalyptic films, these very, very long takes. And I've always been a fan of the long take. When I read Pascal's essay on the long take in undergrad, um, and when Miles assigned it to us, I was like, oh my God, like, there's something kind of just blew open in me, like thinking about the long take as an expansion of the present moment, right? Um, and I heard something uh, recently by uh, a writer and a thinker I really admire, Bio Optimalafe, who's talking about prophecy. And he says, prophecy is not a prediction of the future, it's an expansion of the present. Um, and so I've been really thinking about that a lot over the past couple of years about um, how plants and animals um, and a lot of different practices are about expanding the present. And what that means for me is how can you be in the present moment with all of its uncomfort and grief and emotions without being tethered to the past, even though the past is also present, and without even having anxiety about the future, because then you're still in the past, right? So how can we kind of just sit in that expanded space and just be in that space? And so um, thinking a lot about the container of a long take in those films helped me to think about um, extended spaces in like right whether they're long sentences or whether it's the container of a particular vantage point and staying in a particular consciousness um and you know it for me it also enacts like how how i kind of experience things like actually like i don't experience things linearly um i don't experience time passing at the same rate all the time um and like how how might i find a way to enact that in the um, so that's kind of those kind of things that are yeah. So you mentioned Vice or the Mail, the Post. I'm just curious. I don't. I guess I think this is a practice that I'm trying to cultivate. Yeah, like I have many like good friends who send me things by the mail, <laughs> um, and they forget to send things back. Um, <laughs> it's 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 sort of something. I mean, like I think about it, and I appreciate them greatly, and I am just bad at like putting a thing in the box and like going to the post office. I don't know why. It's also like I forget to floss my teeth. Right? There's certain things, and it's not about like lack of forms. Um, so I think it's something that I've been trying to cultivate, and at least with the poems, I think I thought about the mail rather than email because I wanted it to be in a form 
that was like, this is definitely yours, and I created it, and there's no other copy of it. Yeah. And if I like made a mistake, that was just like part of it. Like there wasn't any editing in there. Um, yeah. That's a lovely last question. Thank you, Janice. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow night at the Poetic Research Bureau, our own Gabrielle Seville and our own Janice Lee. Um, if you don't have the info, come and find me and I'll put you know, it's online. PRB, Poetic Research Bureau. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Yeah, it's all recorded. Wow, good. Yeah, no glitches, good. Yeah, we don't have many participants, but I think that's it. Yeah, what do you mean? Like the, the live audience. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. oh, you can see it up there. Okay. Because yeah. we decided we would just slide later with Janice if we could put it on there. Okay. Um, yeah. I would like, we all, who we want. Yeah, we want it. Okay. Yeah, for now, we we'll just uh, leave it there. Yeah. Okay. She probably will want to look at it. That's my guess. Okay. <laughs>